I don't know. Uh, whatever the, the theme song was, I, you can just put it in, in your own head if you so wish. Let's see if this pen is working. Uh, it's not. Let's see if it's working now. I think I figured it out. No, there we go. Brilliant. Okay, we're going to look at the particles and density. Change the state and energy calculation. So, um, basically, we've got three states of matter, solids, liquids, and gas. When we go from a solid to a liquid, then we increase the amount of kinetic energy inside the particles, so they're able to vibrate more. Solids, they vibrate around a fixed point, and in liquids, they've got enough kinetic energy to be able to um, move over each other. Gases have got so much kinetic energy that they're able to fill the container that they're put in. Density depends on the state of the substance. In solid, solids, the particles are packed close together. In liquids, the particles are free to move, so the same mass takes up more space. And in gases, the particles take up a much greater volume than in liquids and solids. For any particular substance, a solid is usually denser than its liquid, and liquid is usually denser than the gas. The exception to this is solid water, ice being less, um, less dense. That's why ice floats on water. Now, the reason why that happens is because it makes a, a, a pretty crystal, la crystal lattice, but uh, it doesn't really matter. Density is the mass of a given volume of substance. The density of a substance is determined by the mass of the atoms it is made from and how closely these atoms are packed together. Density is mass divided by volume. That letter there is rho. Um, you can, if you want to, do capital D. It's what we use in maths. It's not really going to affect you if you're right or wrong, but if you see that little p, that little p is actually rho, and it stands for density. What does this all mean? The density is the amount of mass for every bit of volume. Different things have got different densities in kilograms per meter cubed. And by the way, one meter cubed is equal to 100 times 100 times 100 centimeters cubed. It is not a one to 100, uh, one to, uh, yeah, it's not a one to 100 ratio. It's a one to one, lots of zeros <laughs> ratio. Let's write that down, one to. Four, five, six, one to one million ratio. And I messed that up as well. Oh my word. Look at that. There we go. Okay. It's density calculation and give it a go. I know in previous, um, these slides seem to have disappeared at some point. And I don't know why. Right. I'm going to be putting core practical videos into the comments or the information section or the whatever that thing is called down there, which you look at in your own time. And I'm going to go through the core practical to find the density of an irregular object. We're going to, in this instance, use some graduated cylinders. But at the end, we are going to be um, looking at how to use an overflow can. So either method is absolutely fine. You can call them an overflow can or you can call it a eureka can. Greek for I see, I see. To find the density of an irregular shaped object, you need to determine its volume. To do this, place it in a known volume of water. So right here, this volume of water is 28 centimeters cubed. And um, the amount of water that's displaced equals the volume of the object. There's a piece of granite there. It's got a mass of 13.5 grams. If we want to convert that into meters cubed, then we are going to divide by 10 to the power of 6 or multiply by 10 to the minus 6. And the amount of volume is equal to the difference between that and uh, what's this, 31, 2, 3, 31, 32, 33. So this is 38 centimeters cubed, meaning its volume is 5 centimeters cubed. So 5 divided by um, 10 to the power of 6 or multiplied by 10 to the minus 6 will get new volume. So we find the density, find the mass using a balance, find the volume using either an overflow can or a graduated cylinder. A change of state can be can be brought about by changing the temperature or pressure of a material. This is super important. The law of conservation of mass. One kilogram of ice has got is one kilogram of water, and it's one kilogram of steam as well. Mass is conserved when it changes state. Only the volume changes. They are not physical changes. The change can be reversed. Physical changes happen when the material can recover its original properties when the reaction occurs or that the reverse reaction occurs. This doesn't happen with chemical changes. The arrows show the direction of the change of state, and it's important to know them. These are two that you might not know. Sublimation going straight from a solid to a gas and deposition going straight from a gas to a solid. Here are some questions. These questions are also available on www.whascience.com. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go through the questions twice just so that you can get an opportunity. So I'm going to go back to the start. One, 
pause, two, pause, three, pause, and here are your answers. Pause, click, click, click. I'm going to go back, click for the answers, click for the answers, click for the answers. Oh, ooh, what's going on there? My word, that seems like an interesting little setup, doesn't it? Let me just fix that. I'm going to do it live. Live on air. Is that going to work? Yay, yeah, look at that. And then there was noise. So, thermal or internal energy and energy transfers. Thermal energy is the energy stored in the system by the atoms and the molecules that make up that system. So, for example, the molecules of water have kinetic energy and some potential energy. The total kinetic energy and the total potential energy in the system makes up the internal energy. The particles inside a liquid or a gas are in constant motion, not just vibrating. They're colliding with each other and the walls of any container they're in. In a solid, the particles are vibrating around a six point. So all of the fixed points, all of these things are combining together to give the total amount of energy inside of the system. We call it thermal energy because ultimately kinetic energy, potential energy and collisions, all of that will ultimately turn into thermal energy. When heat is added to a system, the internal energy of the particles increases. This can result in the material changing state. In particles, particles can only vibrate, so they cannot move relative to each other. This molecule can only vibrate, oscillate around a fixed point. It cannot move to the top of the solid in any meaningful way. When the solid is heated, the particles gain kinetic energy and vibrate faster and faster. When they get enough kinetic energy, when they get enough energy to increase the, the internal energy, uh, increase my kinetic energy here, they turn into a liquid. In a liquid, the particles are moving fast enough to break free from the solid. They can break what's called intermolecular bonds. Intermolecular bonds are the bonds between molecules that keep them fixed together in a solid. And I'm going to change the color of my pen because this is all orange. I'm going to do that. Now you all know how to change a pen. So you're learning two things at once. Intermolecular bonds, where's my pen gone? There it is, are between the molecules. In the gas, the particles have got enough energy to break free from their container. They have enough energy to, to break all the intermolecular bonds that there are and make the volume whatever it is that they want it to be. They can move away from their container and other gas particles. So the volume of the container, the volume of a gas is equal to the volume of the container in which it is it is kept. So if this was a one meter cubed container, the volume of this gas would also be one meter cubed. Temperature increase of an object depends on what it is made of. If you were sitting in a sunny, if you were on a, if you were on a, in a sunny park and there was a metal bench here, and there was a wooden bench here, and it had the same amount of sun shining down on it, then the metal bench would increase its temperature more than the wooden bench. The mass of the object and the amount of energy input into it would also affect it. So if I have a small little cube and a big little cube, and I put them both into a Bunsen burner, this is going to, uh, the little cube is going to increase its temperature more than the big cube and the amount of energy put into it. So if I put something under a Bunsen burner for one second versus for 10 seconds, the object that's been under for 10 seconds is gonna be a lot warmer than the object that was put in for one second. To calculate the temperature change, the formula for specific heat capacity has to be arranged. This is the formula for specific heat capacity. Q is equal to the mass multiplied by the specific heat capacity multiplied by the change in temperature. The amount of energy that is put in is equal to the amount of mass the specific capacity and the temperature change in there. Specific capacity is the energy needed to raise one kilogram of a substance by one degree Celsius. Here's the equation. Change in thermal energy can be determined using the mass, specific capacity and change of temperature of an object. And again, whenever you want, just pause to have a read. Here's a little question for you to have a go of. It's a worked question. Go through each step and see if you get the answer right. Now, latent heat is the energy needed to change the state of a substance, to turn something that is a solid into something that's the worst cube I've ever drawn. Do you know what? I'm just going to do that. That's that's the second worst cube I've ever drawn. Last time's a charm. Oh, there we go. There we go. There we go. Right, that's enough. The amount of energy needed to turn ice into water. The amount of energy needed to change the state of a substance or to turn water into 
<laughs> How do you do the difference? Into gas. Latent heat is the energy needed to change the state of a substance without changing its temperature. This ice will stay at zero degrees Celsius until um, it has melted into water. This water will stay at zero degrees Celsius until more energy is put into it. The energy supplied is used to change the internal energy store of the substance. So the energy is being used to make the particles vibrate faster. That vibration will cause a change of state, but it will not cause an increase in temperature. Latent heat for melting is called a specific latent heat of fusion, and latent heat for evaporating is called a specific latent heat of vaporization. The specific latent heat of fusion for water is 300, 336,000 joules per kilogram. This is one kilogram of ice at zero degrees Celsius, one kilogram of water at zero degrees Celsius. There has been exactly 336,000 joules of energy put into this kilogram of ice to turn it into that kilogram of water. Specific latent heat is the amount of energy required to increase one kilogram of a substance, to change the state, pardon me, of one kilogram of a substance without changing its temperature. Here's a thermal internal, oh, sorry, pardon me. Here's another internal energy equation you can have a go of. There's loads of practice ones on whascience.com. And here's your answer. Thermal energy for a change of state can be determined using the mass and specific latent heat capacity. Q is equal to N times L. And actually, I don't like specific latent heat capacity. We're just going to call it a specific latent heat. <clears throat> Here's another equation for you to have a go of. And here's your answers. This is a heating and cooling curve. Now, a lot of people don't like this because they don't like the idea of heating something and its temperature not changing. But remember, when you're changing state, if I'm changing the state of substance A, all the energy that's going in is being used to change the state. And changing the state will imply either freezing, melting, condensing, or vaporizing, evaporating. Vaporizing or evaporating. As heat energy is added to a solid, the temperature rises until it reaches its melting point. So we're looking at down here. Heat energy has been added in. So it starts off at zero degrees Celsius. Uh, or minus, this could be, I don't know, minus 10. I don't really care. Let's say this is water, actually. We're going to say this is water just so we've got something to look at. And this is minus 10 degrees Celsius. As heat energy is added to a solid, the temperature rises until it reaches its melting point. So my temperature has now risen to the melting point of water, which is zero degrees Celsius. As the substance melts, all the heat energy added is used to change the state of the substance with no temperature change. So we've not stopped heating my substance. My substance is still heating a Bunsen burner. But this stage here, all the heat energy that is being introduced into the system, all the energy that's going into system A, into the water, into my block of ice, is being used to change the state. So it can't be used to increase the temperature. When all the substance has melted, the temperature will then rise until the boiling point is reached. So we're still heating it at the same amount, and it's going to rise until it hits boiling point of 100 degrees Celsius because we're talking about water. Only Everything has got different boiling points. Heat energy is now being used to change the state from a liquid into a gas. So at this point, all the energy that's going in into my substance is being used to change the temperature so it can't change it's, pardon me, changing the state so it can't change the temperature. And afterwards, we can increase my temperature as much as I want. Different devices have got different energy values. So when we're talking about energy transfers and energy in total, one thing that always comes up is this idea of, whoopsie, pardon me, um, is this idea of reducing unwanted energy transfers. Devices can waste heat in many ways. The most common one is friction. Thermal energy between the moving part of a car or motorbike, any surface. So if I've got surface A moving in this direction and I've got surface B that's either stationary or moving in this direction, it's going to create friction, which will generate thermal heat. Sound energy isn't a thing. It's, it's, it's uh, pretty much thermal heat, but that's, that's neither here nor there. Sound will make, um, will waste, will waste energy, will waste heat. Electrical circuits are... Um, when I've got an electron colliding with the positive nucleus of an atom inside a wire, it causes an oscillation of that atom inside the wire. But because it cannot heat, even though the even though it, pardon me, it cannot move, even though its kinetic energy is increasing, it will actually increase its thermal energy and also increase the resistance of the circuit. And thermal energy will just move from hot areas to cold areas, always. But we want to reduce unwanted energy transfers. There's a couple of things we can do. We can lubricate my mechanical devices, which means that I, I can add something to in between my two um, my two 
surfaces that are moving over each other that will reduce the friction between the two of them, thereby re reducing wasted heat. Thermal energy it can be stopped. This transfer from hot to cold can be stopped cold haha, if we add in some kind of an insulation. Insulation is material that has got low conductivity. If it's got low conductivity, it takes a long time for heat to get through it. Um, and I'm going to show you, so I'm going to put those videos into the link for you as well to you look at in your leisure. And now we're going to talk about temperature, pressure and um, absolute zero. But th th these will be there for you, don't worry, and they're just going to be explained a lot easier than that. As the temperature of a fixed volume gas increases, the pressure increases too. And every day we use, like we use the Celsius scale to measure temperature. So 100 degrees Celsius. Freezing point of water is zero degrees Celsius. Give me one second here, actually. I don't like this either. I don't know why I've done it. I don't know what's happened. I don't know how I've managed it. I can't find my mouse. Okay, nobody panic. There we go. Look at that. Pretty, pretty, pretty. Okay, that should be better. Right, so at zero degrees Celsius, and this is 100 degrees Celsius. But we also use the Kelvin scale to measure temperature. Now, Kelvin is the same amount of steps as degrees Celsius on the same scale, which means an increase of one degree Celsius is also the same as an increase of one degree Kelvin. However, they start at different points. Zero Kelvin is minus 273 degrees Celsius. This is absolute zero. Absolute zero is the point where particles stop moving, where they have absolutely no kinetic energy. It's a theoretical temperature because we can't actually get down to that temperature. But zero Kelvin, absolute zero, means that there is no kinetic energy, there is no movement, and the temperature is minus, 207, minus 273 degrees Celsius or zero Kelvin. If a sealed can of air or gas is heated, the molecules of air move faster and faster. The collisions of these molecules on the inside walls of the container create a pressure. So if I've got little particles of air here and they're hitting into the walls of the container, that's what creates pressure. The hotter the molecules, the faster they move, the more pressure they exert. If the can continues to be heated, the pressure will keep rising steadily. The graph shows what's shows that gas pressure is directly related to temperature. It is uh, as temperature increases, pressure increases. It is a linear graph. It is directly proportional. There's no numbers there for to use my graph, but at least I've got two marks. When a gas is compressed inside a fixed container, there are more particles in a given volume to strike the walls of the container. Therefore, the pressure in the container walls increase. So here I've got volume one, here I've got volume two. If I decrease the volume, there's more particles per bit of volume, so there's more pressure per, you know, smack. The pressure produces a net force at right angles to the wall, which means the pressure will act evenly in all directions. If you get a sealed syringe with a fixed amount of gas inside, the particles will be colliding with the syringe walls, creating a pressure. If I pull out the plunger, the same amount of gas will be occupying a greater volume. This will result in fewer collisions against the syringe wall, so gas pressure will be reduced. Now, here are your questions. Ba -ba -da boom. Da -ba -ba -da -bee. Happy days. And I'll go back and show those again. There you go. And another one. And the last one. Your answers. Answer here. Answer here. Tell me how long to leave it for. I don't leave it too long or too short. So just, just tell me if it's not enough or if, if you want some more. Back to your answers. That was probably not enough time. Don't worry, it's coming up soon. Ah, oh, did I press record? Let me just check if I pressed record. Sorry. Just want to double check. Did I press record? I did. Okay, good. All right. Um, I'm sorry. I'll go back to the last answer sheet there just to give you a bit of time. What I'm going to do now is go through the core practicals, tell you how we did them here. So we're investigating densities to find the density of a solid, an irregular solid, a regular solid, and a liquid. First off, to find the mass of anything, you're going to use a balance. I'm going to change the, 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 the 
oh, way to use words, McKelvey. Wait, I'm going to change the color. We're going to use a balance. It is not a scale. It is a balance. Just use it. Use it. Just use it. Just, just it's a balance. We're going to find the mass of a liquid. Find the mass of the graduated cylinder. To find the mass of a liquid, find the mass of a graduated cylinder, then add the liquid in. So this is empty. Add the liquid in. And whatever the change in, in mass was, that will be the new difference. So this is 352.5 with the liquid in. It was 199.8 without the liquid in. So the difference will be that to take away that. And then convert to kilograms by dividing by a million. To find the volume of anything, read from the bottom of the meniscus. OK, so the bottom of the meniscus, if I look into my graduated cylinder, the meniscus it, it's where the water curves down. You always read from the bottom. OK, so if this number at the bottom here is 12 and this number at the top here is 13, 12 is the correct one. To find the mass of an irregular solid or a regular solid, use a balance and convert it to kilograms. So I'm just finding the mass by putting my thing on the balance. For a regular solid, find the volume by measuring with the calipers. So you're going to measure, if it's a, something like a cuboid, measure the width by the height by the length. Multiply those three together, and that will equal the volume. But I can't find the width and height and length of this. It is not an irregular, a regular shape, so I'm going to use my overflow can. So I fill up my water to its highest point. The water will come out. I then plop my irregular object in. Whichever water comes out is equal to the volume of the, um, the, the material I put in. If it floats, push it below the water line with a pin. Now, why don't you stop there, describe the steps. There's some pictures on the left to help you. And how would you strengthen what you got? Well, here are some nice little questions. And here are some answers. And here's a new practical. We want to find the specific capacity of water. Now, I'm going to remind you that the equation for specific capacity Q is equal to M times C times delta theta. So to find this, we need to measure this, this, and this. To find the mass of the liquid, find the mass of the polystyrene cup. Add the liquid, find the new mass, find the difference, converse to kilograms. So um, 1.96 grams here without any water in it, and then 156.36 grams here with the water in it. Now, we want to find the total amount of energy. We want to find Q. And Q can be found by multiplying the current by the voltage by the time that the current is flowing for. We can also write that as E is equal to I times V times T. So we need an ammeter to measure current, a voltmeter to measure voltage, and a stopwatch, which we don't have, but which I can draw in, uh, to find the time taken to find the energy transfer. We also need to find the start temperature and the end temperature. So if the start temperature was 21 degrees Celsius, and after our experiment finished, it was at 42 degrees Celsius. To find delta theta, we take away 42 from 21. Oh, look, it's 21 degrees Celsius. Didn't mean to do that. Now, analog thermometers, old-fashioned thermometers aren't very useful, so a better experiment would be using a digital thermometer. And if you wanted to, if you have one at your home, you can bring it in and use it yourself. You can use a joule meter. A joule meter would measure the amount of energy supplied without having to do E is equal to V times I times T. Here are some equations. That's no, here's some questions. Just try to do the experiment. Just, just try to. And here are some questions. Oh, hang on. There are questions for the two of them. All right, hang on. Sorry, folks. Before you do those questions, this is another investigation that we have to do to draw a cooling or heating curve. You need water in a solid state. So that is ice. We wanted to make a oh, curve. It's right down here. I've already added it. Look over here. This is what we're trying to do. So we find the initial temperature of the ice and we find out it's minus 10 degrees Celsius. We use a stopwatch to measure the time as time goes by. So every, let's say every 30 seconds, we're going to measure the time. Um, and we're going to note the time and every 30 seconds, we're going to see what the new temperature is using my thermometer. Digital thermometer is more accurate than the traditional thermometers. And then we plot it on a graph. Time on the x-axis, temperature in degrees Celsius on the right axis. Here are the questions for the two experiments. I messed up my, I didn't do that. Somebody else did that, but they're not going to be shamed, named and shamed. And here are the answers. And that's that. Any questions, pop them in the comments or send me an email.